Example 151 Tech. A group of undergraduate biology majors were randomly assigned to one of four GRE test prep strategies, and their post prep GRE exam scores for the quantitative reasoning portion of the GRE were recorded. The first group participated in a Kaplan's GRE preparation course, the second group participated in a Test Master's GRE preparation course, the third group enrolled in a self paced GRE prep course online, and the last group studied on their own without participating in a prep course. All the students in the study had taken the GRE once before the experiment began. There was no significant difference between the previous GRE scores on the quantitative reasoning section. The GRE scores on the quantitative reasoning portion for the test for the four groups are included below, along with part of the output from a statistical software package called SPSS. Fill in the missing parts of the ANOVA table and answer the set of questions that follow. Okay, so let's take a look at the data they've given us. So they have the results there for the three groups, or four groups actually. They have Kaplan, the test masters group, the self-paced group, and then the control. And then after that, they have the SPSS output included. We're not gonna look at the raw data so much. We wanna pay attention mainly to the output because they've provided us all the work really. We just need to interpret what's been given. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this table. And it's essentially an ANOVA table that's not completed, right? So what we need to do is go through and figure out the missing parts first. And that's the first thing they ask us to do is to complete the table. All right, so let's start filling in the table by recognizing a simple idea, and that is that the total sum of squares that's located here, this total sum of squares, consists of the sum of the sum of squares for treatments plus the sum of squares for error. So these two, in other words, add up to 1609. That means we should be able to simply do 1609.000 minus 125.857 to determine the answer for this piece of the table. So let's go ahead and type that into our calculator to speed things up. We'll have 1609 minus 125.857. And when you're done, you get 1483.143. So 1,483.143. So that is the value there in the error position. All right, good, so now that we have the error sum of squares filled in, we can go after the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are actually pretty easy. It's basically going to be, for the treatments, k minus one, where k is the number of treatments we have. And number of treatments we have in this case, or another way to think about it here, is the number of groups or categories. We have one, two, three, four, right? Because we have the Kaplan group, the test masters group, self-paced group, and control group. If we take away one from that number, so there's four groups, we take away one from that, we end up with three as our degrees of freedom. So there's that number. For the total degrees of freedom, for the number that goes here, all we have to do is count up how many measurements we had and then take one away from it. Well, that should be pretty easy. If you think about it, we have four columns here, and each column has what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers in it, correct? So four times seven is 28. That means that the total degrees of freedom must be 27. Okay, so we just need to figure out the error degrees of freedom. Now remember, the error degrees of freedom works just like the sum of squares in that we can get the answer for that value by using subtraction. The total degrees of freedom is derived by basically saying the degrees of freedom for the treatments plus error is equal to the total degrees of freedom. That means we're looking for three plus some unknown quantity is equal to 27. You can solve that in your head. The answer must be 24, right? So the value here is 24. All right, and then we need to come up with the mean square for the table. The mean square is pretty easy. For MST, we basically would have taken this three degrees of freedom and divided it into this sum of squares. That's how you get the mean square for treatments. It's the same thing for the mean square for error. We divide its degrees of freedom into the sum of squares to get that value. By the way, it's worth checking to see if our number for the mean square in the treatment row is correct. Let's go ahead and do that. If we were to take 125.857 and divide it by that degrees of freedom, which is three, we do indeed get the 41,952. Let's do the sum of squares for error divided by its degrees of freedom. That'll be 1483.143 divided by 24. And when we do that, we get the answer 61.798. All right, and then there is no mean square for total, right? We don't need to figure that out. That doesn't exist, right? So you don't have to worry about these positions. And we don't need to worry about anything here, right? There's no F for error. The F is the test stat here in this table, and all we have to do then is to determine what this quantity is here. 
And the way we do that is pretty straightforward. We actually take the MSE or the mean square error and divide it into the mean square for treatments and that will produce our F test stat. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. In other words, we're gonna take 41.952 and we're gonna divide that by that 61.797. So 61.797625. I could have just brought that down by hitting second answer, but I just wanted to type it in so everyone could see what I'm doing. Hit enter and you get 0 0.679. All right, so that's your F test stat. It's 0 0.679, which is not a large number, right? Remember, F test stats should be over 1, or as they start to approach a value that's significant, they have to be over 1, right? Because if they're equal to 1, it means there's no difference between, or it seems to be there's no difference between the, the between variation and the within variation. So in other words, when that F test stat is 1, it indicates that there is not a significant treatment effect, right? So that would indicate that the treatment is not significant. Or in other words, that the treatment is not producing any more variation than we would get from just the random error. Now, this number is actually even smaller than one, so it's not gonna be significant. And you can see that by this significance level here. That's a p-value basically, right? So they call it significance, but it really is the observed significance they're referring to, or in other words, the p-value. And they're saying the p-value here is 57.4%. In other words, not significant at all. And remember, it's small p-values that we think are significant, right? So this is not a small p-value. Small p-values would be something like under, say, 5%. In this case, this is 57%, certainly not small by any measure. We normally don't consider values that are over 10% to be small, right? So 10% might be a significance level that's used in a hypothesis test. Sometimes you might even see 20, I suppose. Certainly would never see anything in the 50s, though. So it's clear that this is not significant. All right, so let's go ahead and answer the questions that they have below to see what the table is telling us. So the first question they ask is, what's the null hypothesis this particular ANOVA procedure is testing? Well, try to remember that we're always testing the hypothesis that all the treatment means are equal to one another. So in this case, there are four treatment means. So basically, the answer to part A is to say that the mean for the first group, which the mean for K is equal to the mean for test masters, is equal to the mean for the self-paced, is equal to the mean for control. So self-paced is equal to the mean for control. So those four means are equal to one another. That is the null hypothesis for the particular ANOVA procedure. The alternative hypothesis would just be that at least two of these means differ from each other significantly, or at least one mean differs from the other significantly, something like that, right? Basically, you're saying they're not all the same in the alternative hypothesis. All right, let's go for part B. It says, what's the p-value for the test? Well, the p-value, again, is that part of the ANOVA table that said significance. So again, in SPSS, they use this sig notation. They're referring to the observed significance level. That's the same as the p-value. So when they're asking us here, they're basically saying that this is our p-value. So we'll say the p-value is equal to 0.574. All right, let's look at part C. What is the decision regarding the null hypothesis? Well, if your alpha value is 5%, but your p-value is 57.4%, right, just converting the p-value from a decibel to a percent, then in this case, the p-value is larger than the significance level. We only reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is smaller than alpha. So in this case, you're going to say, do not reject the null. Do not reject the null. And we're not rejecting the null here because, again, that p-value is larger than the significance level. It's not just larger, it's a lot larger, right? And then in part D, they say, based on the results of this experiment, do prep courses help biology majors improve their quantitative GRE scores? Well, we're not rejecting the null, right? So we're saying that we should not reject this idea. But that idea says that all the prep courses or all the preparation strategies that we studied in this problem are equal to one another or they produce equal results. And the problem is this last one is just what? the control group, which didn't actually do any test prep. So we're basically saying is that 
that control group that didn't actually participate in any specific test prep procedure. They didn't do a self-paced course. They didn't use a, a company like Kaplan or Test Masters. They basically just studied on their own. That they did as well as the other three groups that used specific test prep strategies. So if that's the case, then the answer to D is it does not seem that prep courses help biology majors improve their scores. All right, then last part is part E. It says based on the design of this experiment, is it possible to conclude that the test prep is not helpful for this population? population of students when attempting to approve their score on the GRE section of the GRE. So it's kind of what we just talked about in D. It is possible here to say that it's not helpful. So what this hinges upon is the fact that that control group was included. If you didn't include the control group, let's say you just had the first three, Kaplan, Test Masters, and then an online self-paced course. If you showed that they were all equal to one another, all you'd be showing then, you know, so in other words, we weren't able to reject the null, so we're basically concluding that they're all equal to one another. If we can't say that they're different for one another, all we might be saying in that case is that they all work equally well in which case you might choose the cheapest version. But on the other hand, it could be that they all work equally well because they don't work at all, in which case none of them work, right? And you wouldn't be able to know which of those scenarios you're dealing with, right? You wouldn't know necessarily if the three methods are effective, but equally effective, or if they're not effective and therefore equally not effective, right? And the only way you would be able to tell that is that they include something like a control group. Here we can say each of these four methods work equally well, according to what we concluded. And in this case, that means they worked no better than the control group, which which didn't actually participate in any prep program. So it would say that then you should not bother to pay for these programs because it seems like the control group did just as well and they didn't go out and spend money on a prep course. So for that reason, um, it looks like in this particular case, the experimental design allows us to say that the prep courses truly do not work.